Welcome to the Art of Precision on Gillette World Sport. Coming up today, we are in the pool with open water swimming champion Marc Antoine Olivier. At the finish line of the 2017 World Rowing Championships in Florida. And in the octagon with Conor McGregor's coaching team. He's always looking to improve, and that's why he is where he is. First on Gillette World Sport, we discover how the most notorious athlete in combat sports got into peak condition for the most lucrative fight in history. Conor McGregor was the first fighter in UFC history to hold two belts in two weight categories at the same time. The Irishman implemented the fighter aerobic and anaerobic system of training, also known as the FAST program, to help improve his conditioning and prepare him for one of the biggest boxing matches of all time. My background is through cycling. What I want to do is bring some of the training strategies into martial arts and combat sports. The FAST program was brought about after Conor McGregor had suffered his first loss to Nate Diaz. It was in large part due to his inability to maintain the level of output for the full five rounds of that bout. Conor, he's a very driven individual and he does have a tendency to always push himself to the limit. The thing is with Diaz, he's always going to be there and I don't care how fit you are, it's still going to be cruel and it's still going to be tough because the style of fire that, that both Diaz brothers are is they're in your face and they don't give you a breath. As soon as you take a step back, they close. You know, once you get tired, you know, you can't function, your brain, your brain shuts down and when that happens, the end is near, you know. He brought in the guys from uh, the FAST program and his conditioning skyrocketed. A good work ethic, it's nothing that Connor could ever be flawed on. He is prepared to do the work. He comes down from upstairs into his garage. We do the sessions. He's done in 12 minutes. And people say, well, that couldn't have been much of a workout. But the thing is, he's lying on his back, gasping for air. He's prepared to do it again and again and again over weeks, over months. And that's when it becomes hard. People start saying, maybe 12 minutes is enough to make me hurt. It's harder for me when I'm doing the pads. Jays, you know what I mean? So I gotta get fitter as well. But it means you, you can get more out of, out of when your condition is right up there. You can do as good in the 12th round as you can in the fourth round, you know? And, and that's what you want. At the beginning with Connor, his skill level was so high compared to his opponents, he could kind of just blast through everybody. But as the skill level goes up, as you're facing opponents who have closer and closer skill level, then conditioning plays a major part. Before Doc came along, before the FAST program came along, there wasn't a very strict plan of when we're going to train, when we're going to rest, how we're going to phase our training. It was just train hard. If you need a day off, take a day off. Not the most scientific approach. And that's what Doc brought in. That's what the FAST program brought in. That whatever amount of weeks we had to train, we could put together a plan. We could put in in cycles of training time and just as important rest time. I am a plan type of guy. I don't like just training off the cuff of my sleeve. I like to have a role written down and be able to follow it. So to have someone like Doc in his expertise was a huge weight off my shoulders. The program was changed a little for the fight against Floyd Mayweather. Mixed martial arts championship event is five by five minute rounds with one minute rest between. That's a cumulative time of 29 minutes. The professional boxing is 12 by three minute rounds plus one minute between. So that's 36 minutes of actual fight time. Where there is a difference is mixed martial arts tends to be more sporadic. Boxing tends to be more of a continuous power output. There were approximately 430 
punches thrown in 10 rounds, which is a lot more than you'd typically see in a mixed martial arts event. It's kind of a back and forth with me and Connor. I do all the pad work with him, and then we, we discuss shots that we think are going to work on various opponents. And if they work, we keep them. If they don't work, we throw them away. The Mayweather fight, it was just boxing. It was just striking. So I, I was at the forefront. When, when we're doing mixed martial arts, John will take the lead role and I will relay to John what shots I think are available. The only difference is we didn't walk any kicks, we didn't need to walk any elbows or knees or anything like that. We just focused trying to, you know, figure out Mayweather and land the shots. And I think we've done all right for a good part of the fight. Oh, pop, pop. Being the bigger man, with hindsight, perhaps had its disadvantages. Connor made weight. He was able to replenish the, the fluid loss and electrolytes quite quickly, but he probably came in with his muscle glycogen a little depleted. This would have eaten into his ability to recover. People say that he didn't have the endurance to, to go the full 12 rounds. Well, I think that's perhaps an oversimplification. I would say it was a lack of recovery rather than, than a lack of endurance. He is capable of going the full distance, but in a semi-starved state, it becomes harder to recover. He got to the 10th round, he, he never looked dazed at our place, he just looked tired. Yeah, I think maybe if he had a bit more time, who knows, at the end of the day, you never know what's gonna happen. Basically, we, we had the time that we had, and we, we, we did what we could, you know? He's always looking to improve, and that's obviously that's why he is where he is. He puts it all out there, he says it, like, I would be afraid to say I'm gonna do this or that to somebody just in case it didn't happen. But if you're brave enough to say it, obviously when it happens you become more successful, and I think that's why he is as successful as he is now, you know? Time now to look at the videos making the social headlines. Egypt's football team and their 44-year-old goalkeeper Essam al Hadari celebrated after seeing their first World Cup qualification since 1990. Also booking their place in Russia was Costa Rica, whose head coach probably regretted promising he'd shave his head if the side made it to next year's tournament. Skater Daiwan Song was taking it easy, stretching out during this grind. Tony Hawk got reacquainted with an old friend as he rode this mega ramp for the first time in 10 years. Pittsburgh Steelers running back, Le'Veon Bell sharpened his past catching skills with the help of a young fan. Greek pole vaulter Emmanuel Carales shared one of his favorite training drills. Free runner Zen Shimada made this smooth leap. Golfer Andrew Beef Johnston showed he's back at full fitness after injury as he hit the weight room. Back in the game. And finally, Lewis Hamilton challenged his followers to guess which helmeted sports star he was playing golf with this week. It was two time NBA champion Steph Curry. Now we catch up with all the best action from the 47th edition of the World Rowing Championships. Over 900 athletes from 69 countries raced at Nathan Bellison Park in Florida as the World Rowing Championships visited the USA for only the second time in its history. 26 events were contested over the eight-day regatta, which took place in perfect rowing conditions. On Friday, the finals included the lightweight men's pair. The current season has been all about Marco Donovan and Shane O'Driscoll of Ireland, who haven't lost a race so far. This race was no different as the Irish pair took the lead after 400 metres and maintained their blistering speed to break away and cross the line first. Four boats were neck and neck in the lightweight men's single skulls until defending champion Paul O'Donovan of Ireland took a small lead, finishing first topping off a successful day for the Irish. Saturday's action saw Olympic champions Martin and Valen Sinkovic of Croatia taking an early lead in the men's pair. Despite a big push from New Zealand, the Croatians were back in the lead coming into the final sprint, but the Italian crew of Matteo Lodo and Giuseppe Vincino were flying. In the last stroke, the Italians became world champions, crossing the line just 0.34 of a second ahead of Croatia. 
The British were defending champions in the men's four, but it was long-standing rivals Australia who took an early lead with nearly a boat length over the rest of the field after 500 metres, but the pack was still tight. Great Britain's crew pushed in the second half of the race, but Australia now had an open water lead, easily securing their gold medal with Great Britain fading further as Italy went into second. These big races you don't remember much. I remember the start being smooth. Um, I remember uh, that we had a push at the 600 metre mark in and we started moving and from there we continued moving probably until the, the 1K, just past the 1K and then it was a matter of uh, holding on by your fingernails. On the final day of racing, the men's double skulls saw Lithuania taking off fast, but John Storey and Chris Harris of New Zealand quickly overtook them and managed to hold off Poland and Italy to take goal. In the blue ribbon boat class of the championships, the eights, Rio Olympic silver medalist Germany took a bow ball lead at the start and was soon opening up a noticeable gap. The United States pushed hard to move into second in front of the home crowd, but Germany showed their superiority with a half a boat length lead as they crossed the line first. Yeah, it was a really tough race because of the wind and the condition, um, because it's very hot. And um, yeah, we are happy to, to do this. 29 countries eventually headed home from the regatta with medals, and we'll now look forward to the next World Championships in Bulgaria next year. Still to come, we dive in for a lesson in open water swimming and rev up at the World Rally Championship in Spain. Welcome back to Gillette World Sport. Coming up, we navigate the 19 stages of Rally Spain and cross the Alps on mountain bikes. Now we talk precision technique with open water world champion swimmer, Marc Antoine Olivier. What I really like about open water swimming is the feeling of freedom you can get, because even if the race is in the same place year in and year out, the conditions can change, as well as the strategy you put in place before and during the race, which is very important. And since I like a challenge, it suits me perfectly. A typical day for me starts by waking up at 6.15 a.m., having breakfast, which lasts around half an hour, as I like to take my time, and then I'll listen to some music to get myself going. Then I arrive at the pool around 7 a.m., I do a small warm-up for around 15 minutes, and then get into the water for around two hours, depending on the season. Olivier lives and trains in Montpellier, France, under the guidance of world-renowned swimming coach Philippe Lucas. Training six days a week alongside some of France's other elite swimmers, the differences between swimming in the pool and in open water are minimal. It isn't all that specific. It's similar to pool swimming, and we train in a pool throughout the week. The most important thing is to take part in a lot of competitions in open water, so you face the challenges involved and your rivals, because you take hits when you're in open water, and it's strategic too. But apart from that, the training always takes place in a pool. There are a few basic differences in my technique depending on where I'm swimming. In open water, I tend to adapt my stroke length or frequency if I'm swimming in the sea where there are waves. You can't afford to make long gliding strokes in waves because they hit your arms and make it more difficult, so I adopt a completely different technique. When I'm swimming in a pool, however, I have a higher frequency of strokes, since you have to exert yourself over a much shorter time. So they are two completely different techniques. Long distance swimmers, so those who swim 5, 10 and 25 kilometers, have a different mindset depending on the race in question. Races can last anywhere from one to five hours, so the mindset prior to the race isn't always the same. 
A 25-kilometer swimmer knows the race will be grueling and will be more focused on keeping strong mentally. Whilst a 5-kilometer swimmer also knows it will be difficult, but will be more focused on the strategy side. Of course, not all races go as I expect them to go beforehand. But that's something nice about open water swimming. You always need to challenge yourself and to put new things in place, which can help you get a good result in the end. Olivier was crowned 5-kilometer open water swimming world champion earlier this year, picking up another gold in the team event and a bronze in the 10-kilometer. However, it was at the Rio Olympics that the French swimmer made his global breakthrough. I'm a natural competitor, so I was hoping I could win at least one medal. But I was very aware that it was my first Olympic Games. And also, as it only occurs every four years, all the athletes are ready and want to win a medal. I knew it was going to be very difficult, but my objective was to win a medal, even though it was only my second year as a pro. And I performed the way I was hoping to and won the bronze. The end of the race was very eventful, because with 1,000 meters to go, I was behind the front five. But I then managed to swim back up, along with Greek swimmer Spiridon Giannotis, who would end up winning the silver medal, and we both caught up with the leading pack. At that point, there were six or seven of us all neck and neck, only 500 meters from the finish line, before Spiridon Giannotis opened up a three-meter gap. He managed to take the lead, and then there were five of us level behind him. But with a last-minute push, Ferry Vertman passed him to become champion. I was very close too, and also managed to give an extra push over the last few meters, so I ended up third behind those two. It was an unbelievable experience. You grow up watching the Olympics on TV, but experiencing it as an athlete is something else. Welcome back to Gillette World Sport. Next, pace notes at the ready as we visit the 11th round of the World Rally Championship. Drivers were welcomed by the familiar territory of the Costa Dorada, south of Barcelona, for round 11 of the 13 event season and the only mixed surfaced event on the calendar. Heading into the weekend, Sebastian Ogier was 17 points clear overall, but with 90 points available from the remaining three rounds, Thierry Neuville and Oit Tanak were still in contention for the title. On Friday, sunshine and high temperatures ensured the dry tracks favoured late starters, as drivers early in the order swept loose gravel aside to leave a cleaner, faster line for those behind. Leader Sebastian Ogier endured the worst of the loose gravel, but masterfully managed to climb back up to second by the end of the day. He stood behind Andreas Mikkelsen, who ended the first day with a 1.4 second advantage as he made his debut for Hyundai after joining last month. Chris Meek won two stages and despite dropping vital seconds with a misjudged corner, he finished the day three seconds off the lead in third. When the action switched to smooth asphalt on Saturday, Meek won the opening speed test of vault from third to first. He then controlled his advantage through the remaining six stages and was leading by 13 seconds at the close of the day. Ogier, Neuville and Oit Tanak traded places on every stage in a thrilling battle for second. After a difficult morning of handling troubles, a strong afternoon including three stage wins for Ogier gave him a one and a half second advantage over teammate Tanak, who lost time when he swiped a concrete block on the inside of a tight bend on the penultimate stage but escaped serious damage. Overnight leader Andreas Mikkelsen hit the same block with the impact ripping a wheel from his car and causing him to drop to sixth. Six more stages lay in wait in Sunday's finale. A troubled weekend for Thierry Neuville came to a head in the Santa Marina speed test. He entered a left bend too quickly and made a deep cut in the following right corner. The impact broke the front right wheel and although he limped to the finish, he was out of the running. Elsewhere, the bad luck continued in a rush to remove his light pod off the Hyundai. Andreas Mikkelsen had forgotten something. With his unsecured bonnet blocking his view, surprisingly, the Norwegian only lost 26 seconds. 
Even rally leader Chris Meek didn't escape trouble, but his lead was so good that he even had time to nose his car into a roundabout and still win stage 15. Meek went on to take the rally win, with Sebastian Ogier fending off teammate Oitanak to claim second by five seconds and expand his comfort zone at the top of the championship leaderboard. Finally this week, we're in the Alps to follow an epic record attempt on two wheels. The legendary Trans-Alps route from Oberstdorf in Germany to Riva del Garda in Italy covers nearly 400 kilometers and 16,000 vertical meters and has been challenging mountain bikers since it was first set in 1989. Riders usually take between five and seven days to successfully complete the route, but reigning European cross-country champion Flo Vogel of Switzerland and Marcus Schulte-Luenzum of Germany set themselves a challenge to complete the route within less than 36 hours. I'm quite curious about exactly what it's going to be like, and I feel both optimistic and scared at the same time. One thing I know is that it's not going to be easy. Their journey began in Obertsdorf in the early hours of September 25th at 5.36 a.m. local time. Supported by a team of technical and nutritional experts en route, the ground on the first part of the trail was wet and slippery after a night of heavy rain. By 6.30 a.m., the team had reached the Austrian border and continued to ride on Swiss soil as the dawn broke. By 5 in the evening, they crossed into Italy. The country's Gavia Pass, which is the 10th highest paved road in the Alps, greeted the riders with drifting snow as they rode through the night. Then, finally, at 8.56 a.m. on September 26th, they successfully reached Riva del Garda, completing their journey in only 27 hours and 20 minutes, over eight hours faster than they had planned. It's been a difficult challenge for me, really difficult, especially when it started to snow overnight. I've never ridden for that long and I'm not very experienced in high altitude terrain, so at that point I genuinely thought I wouldn't make it to the end. I actually feel quite good at the moment. We've experienced everything in the last 28 hours. Sun, rain, snow. We've basically had it all. And I wouldn't say that I feel fresh, but I feel surprisingly good. I thought I'd feel very different. It's really been a great experience.